will sing to the Lord because He gave us His love. Uh -huh. Alleluia, Alleluia. Come on, let's sing to the Lord because He gave us His love. Uh -huh. Alleluia, Alleluia. Ah, Alleluia, Alleluia. Come on, let's praise the Lord because He gave us His love. Uh -huh. Alleluia. Alleluia, come on, let's praise the Lord because he gave us his love. Like I said, I'm very honored um, to be sharing my story. I know that many of you in your countries probably um, don't know my story. And I do uh, want to talk about the different holy faces of Jesus that I've encountered. Um, Jesus, um, you know, we have the agonizing Jesus. We have the merciful Jesus, you know, the face of mercy. And I've encountered... Um, Jesus's holy face and many uh, moments of my life. And I'm going to start when I was a child at the age of three. I mean, the first memories I have of my family, um, you know, it was very joyful, uh, loving family. And I remember one weekend um, on a Sunday, we went to a flea market and my mom was looking at a sacred image of our Lord, um, like a beautiful, a beautiful frame with the sacred heart of Jesus. And I remember asking my mom, mommy, who, who, who is this? And she said, this is Papi Dios. This is daddy God. And that was um, the first time I've ever seen Jesus before. And my mother hung uh, that image above her bed. And as a little child, that image, uh, the, the image of the sacred heart, the devotion grew with me. When I was, um, you know, just very young, I went to CCD to prepare for my first communion. Now, as a family, we never actually practiced our faith. Um, you know, coming from a Hispanic culture, um, we were very traditional. So we only went to mass when a family member, um, you know, was gonna get married, or if there was a baptism, or if a family member um, was gonna receive their first communion, but we never really went to mass on Sundays. We never, prayed as a family. I don't, I didn't know how to pray the rosary. I don't remember a Bible being in our home, but I do remember that image of the sacred heart of, of Jesus. And when I was, you know, um, a child, my mom signed me up for CCD class. And that's when I really got to know God, the father, I had a huge connection with God, the father. Um, I would, after CCD, I would go into my backyard and I would talk to him. I'd look up at the sky and I, I would speak to God, the father. And I would tell my mom, mom, I really want to send God love notes. How do I do this? So my mom would buy me balloons um, and put helium in it. And I would write these little love notes to God, the father, because I wanted to send these notes to heaven. And I would write these little love notes to God and I would fold it up in a little piece of paper and tie it on the ribbon. And I would go to my backyard and I would just send it off to heaven. And I would wait there until that balloon disappeared off into the sky. And I felt really loved by God, the father. But after my Holy communion, um, it was basically the last time that I had any type of connection with God, um, received my Holy communion. And then that was it. My mom started to get into the New Age movement pretty heavily, um, and this, is, was in, this was in the 90s. This was like very popular in the 90s. Um, she would put Shirley MacLaine videos, VHS videos. A lot of young people, when I say VHS, they have no idea what I'm talking about, but um, you, us older people, we know um, that, you know, what a VHS was. And I would practice, you know, to line up my chakras, awaken the serpents inside of me. And I started to believe in reincarnation as a very young child. So the little, little, little faith that we had as Catholics, I mean, we were far off. So Jesus was not the king of our home, even though we had his image um, hung up in, in my parents' bedroom, um, Satan entered our household. We opened many, many demonic doors. And uh, in school, I was basically a girl that was after the world. I wanted, you know, to have good grades because I wanted to be successful. I wanted to be rich. I wanted to be famous. I was very vain, very popular, had a lot of friends. Um, and my goal in life was to be somebody in life. Um, I didn't know that I was a child of God. I didn't know my, you know, my purity and my virginity was a treasure. I never um, knew what chastity was, never had the talk at home. And, you know, my parents couldn't give me something that they didn't have. They, they didn't have formation. They didn't know what authentic love was. They didn't know um, what it was to, be, to live in purity. They actually never married through the church. So they couldn't teach me something that they themselves didn't have. 
And in the 12th uh, year of my life, I was 12 years old, sixth grade, I remember they announced that Planned Parenthood was coming to my school to teach us a course on sexuality. Now, 1992, um, we had no internet. There was no YouTube. I had no idea a pro-life movement existed. So whatever I received that day in school, um, I believe it was truth. I didn't receive any type of formation at home, like I mentioned. So I received my formation from the world. And my parents gave me permission to attend this course. At 12 years old, I was still playing with dolls. I was still playing at the park. I was riding my bike every day. I had never thought about sex, ever. So I had no, no idea what sex was. Nevertheless, abortion. I had no idea what that was. So I uh, got to class that day of the course. And I remember getting to my desk and there was a banana on my desk with, I mean, a ton of condoms around that banana. And I started to giggle because I didn't know, I mean, I, I didn't know what, what it was. And I turned to look at my classmates, we're all laughing and giggling because we were about to learn what sex was. I mean, we kind of had an idea, but we really didn't know. And a physician came into to our class, a nurse and a counselor. And they said that they were gonna teach us how to practice safe sex. You know, kids, there's a lot of STDs out there in the United States. There's a lot of unwanted pregnancies. So we're going to show you how to practice applying these condoms on this banana so you learn how to be responsible and protect yourself. Um, you know, safe sex is the answer. Now, safe sex does not exist. Uh, I believe this was all a trap. I believe that since this was the abortion industry, you know, blood money, market money, they were just looking for future abortion patients. Um, they were promoting something very false that fails. They, they know that safe sex fails. And what they were doing was they were opening this curiosity and desire for us to start experimenting on sexuality. That's what was happening because they never spoke about the heart. They never spoke about dignity and true love. They basically just showed you how to protect your genital area. And, you know, they did recommend that we would start experimenting, that we would start with masturbation. They said masturbation was something um, very good for our health because it released anxiety. Uh, they said, you know, start practicing on yourself. This way you could avoid, you know, practicing with multiple partners and avoid getting STDs and, so that's exactly what happened in this class. And they spoke about women's rights. And, uh, you know, if you ever, you know, caught up in an unwanted pregnancy, abortion is the answer. Abortion is your choice. It's your body. Um, it's not a baby until it's, you know, you're five months pregnant, five months gestation, um, because, it, you know, it's, it, there's formation, but it's not completely formed. So it's not a baby. Like I said, there was no technology like we have today. I, you know, if we wanted to investigate on abortion, we would have to go to a library and look through these big books that look like the Bible. And I mean, we just believed everything that they told us that day. And I remember saying, okay, so safe sex is the answer. If I ever fall in love and find a boyfriend, then I know how to be responsible. And that was a distortive concept I had about love. And uh, things were really bad with my parents at, at home. Like I said, uh, we opened very big demonic doors. My parents were having issues in their marriage. And that year, 1992, they decided to separate. And I was rebellious. I didn't understand why my mom had left. I stayed with my father. My mom left to Mexico. And I was very angry. So I grew up my teenage years partying, drinking, um, only caring about myself. You know, if I arrived at a party, I had to be the prettiest. I had to have the best clothes and completely vain. Um, you know, just wanting to be rich, like I said, getting straight A's, yes. But it was because I wanted uh, the material goods in life. Uh, God was not in my heart anymore. I stopped looking up at the sky. I stopped running to my backyard. I stopped writing those love notes many years, many years ago. And uh, I lived a world, a dark world. At the age of 19, I met my first boyfriend. I was still a virgin. At my age back then, 19, being a virgin still, I was the only virgin in, in you know, the group of friends that I had and basically the only virgin in school. 
after that course in Planned Parenthood, when I was 12 years old, we started hearing rumors. Oh, Becky lost her virginity. Oh, did you hear that? Blah, blah, blah is pregnant and had an abortion. I mean, they, these people that came to our school, they really did, you know, benefit off that course because my friends started having sex. People started experimenting. And I, there's something inside of me that I just decided to wait for the right one. So when I started to date my boyfriend, he was a few years older than myself. Um, I thought that giving your body and giving your heart was true love. So I decided to start, you know, having sex because that was love. I'm going to show him that I love him. So I'm going to give him my virginity. So we started to practice safe sex with the condom, what I learned in school. But something went wrong. And I don't know what went wrong because I started to feel very nauseous, um, throwing up. I wasn't getting my menstrual cycle. And I thought, there's no way I'm pregnant. I am a straight A student. I'm smart. I'm being responsible. And I'm doing what they taught me in school. Took the pregnancy test in my bedroom. It was not fear when that test came out positive. It was panic. And I thought, my dreams, my goals, my life is over. I am 19 years old. This is not success. I'm not even married. My parents, my dad's going to kick me out of the house. I'm going to shame my father, you know, because also coming from a Hispanic culture, you know, we gossip a lot in, in, in Latin America. So I'm going to shame my father. And I mean, I, I'm going to be stuck at home with no, with no dreams. And this was panic. And I called my boyfriend immediately and I told him the news, but his words, you know, of affirmation, of security, I will take care of you. Don't worry. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to provide for both of you. You are secure. You know, I'm going to help you. You're not alone. And it's, it's, it's okay. Something changed in my heart, that panic and that fear started to diminish And those words of a man that takes responsibility, that comforts the woman, that calms her down, does have the potential to save lives. And unfortunately today, I mean, I've worked in this pro-life industry for 15 years. I've worked with many women that have had abortions. And I'm finding out that there are more men that are scared to be fathers than women to be mothers. You know, women are lacking that support of man Women are being taken to the abortion clinics by man. Women are forced by man. Man are, is driving that woman or paying for the abortion or man just abandons. And there is an issue with men having abortions today, you know, with that fear and that panic. And it's man that is created to protect the family, to protect life. And that's exactly what my boyfriend was doing. This saves lives. And I decided to continue with my pregnancy. I remember the first ultrasound I remember looking at the screen. I was two months pregnant. I started to see life forming. I saw a little head. I saw little arms and I heard a heartbeat. And I felt like, wow, there's life growing inside of me. And I felt joyful. And I would, you know, grab my womb at night and I would rock my womb like to sleep. You know, I'm thinking, oh, there's something growing inside of me. And I was very excited. I was four months pregnant. My belly started to show. And my friends started to worry. And one day they came over to my my house and they started to cry. And they said, please, Patricia, you're not ready to be a mother. You know, you have a whole life ahead of you. You're a straight student. You know, you're going to college. You have so much to look forward to. Please, this is not the convenient time for you. Please, you have time to get an abortion. You're not five months pregnant yet. Remember, you know, it's not completely formed. So that means it's just a clump of cells. It's not a baby. Remember what we learned in school. That fear started to come back into my heart again, the panic. Now, I don't think my friends were evil. I really do believe they were crying because they wanted the best for me. We were just a group of ignorant girls that was taught the wrong formation. And, you know, I started to to have doubts and I thought, you know what? They're right. What am I doing? Like, this is not the time. I'm going to go have an abortion, you know, but I'm not going to tell my boyfriend the truth because he's not going to accept an abortion. He's Mexican. He's Hispanic and people in Mexico don't have a, have an abortion. So I'm just going to tell him I had a miscarriage, go get an abortion, get it over with. 
And, and then I can be the same girl I was before. And the moment I decided to have an abortion, I disconnected from my womb. My heart closed. Um, and I decided to make that appointment. Made the appointment early morning, nine o'clock. It was like a Tuesday morning. It was during the week. I remember pulling up to the abortion parking lot, the abortion clinic parking lot. The shame started right there. When I got out of my car and closed the door and I see my reflection on the window, this umbrella of shame just started to hover over me. There's so much shame connected to abortion. And the shame still comes. I mean, I still have it sometimes. It's the devil going like this, reminding you, remember what you did? This is what you did and what you are. Shame's always, just always attacking the woman that had an abortion. But I felt extreme shame walking into that clinic. And I remember looking down at the floor and telling myself, I will not look at anybody in the lobby. I just want to go get this over with and forget all about this abortion and be the same person I was before. But when I entered the lobby, I couldn't help but to look at a bunch of sneakers, Converse, Keds, just teen shoes. And I look up and I just see a bunch of 13, 14, 15 year olds that were there to have their abortions that day as well. I was the only person that was an adult. And I'm talking about 30 teens in that, in that lobby. And I go to the front and I ask the receptionist, wait a minute, it's Tuesday. Why are these teens here? Aren't they supposed to be in school? And you know, why are they having abortions? Oh, here in the state of California, a girl can cut school. It's her right and come have an abortion without her parents' consent. Now, there's been cases in California, very few, but there has been, where a mother thinks that her child is in junior high all day. And she gets that call saying, your daughter had an abortion and did not survive. Can you imagine how horrific this, lay, this law is? But if you want to buy Tylenol in California, if you want to buy NyQuil because you have a cold, you have to be 21 years of age. But you can have an abortion at the age of 13. I go in to the operation room. And I'm nervous because like I said, I don't know what an abortion is. I, there's no YouTube, there's, no, there's nothing. I, I don't know what this is. I'm scared. And this abortionist comes in, a beautiful woman. She looked very well put together. She said, don't be nervous. Look, I've had an abortion myself. I performed two abortions on my daughter last year. You're gonna be okay. I'm okay. My daughter's okay. It's only gonna take five minutes. Now, I've worked in the medical field for many years, and I was working as a receptionist at a medical office at this point. And I was always taught honesty, patient care. I respect doctors highly. So I respected what she was telling me. I trust doctors. So I wor I'm working in this atmosphere. And I thought that she was being truthful and honest. And I thought, oh, she's had one. She, she, she wouldn't hurt me. She, did, why, she wouldn't hurt her own daughter. So why would she hurt me. And I can put up with five minutes. I blocked myself. I closed my eyes and I said, I can survive this. And that's what women do. They have to block themselves to survive this because it is scary. It is scary when you hear that vacuum. It's a very strong machine. It's 28 times stronger than your household vacuum cleaner. And those five minutes passed by, but I did feel after that abortion that something was sucked out of me, like something was sucked out. There was something missing in my womb. There's like a hole. But at the same time, I felt relief. My problem is solved. And this is what women think, that an abortion solves your problem, that it's a solution. And they never know that the real problems start after the abortion, that hell, living hell starts after an abortion. The only post-care instructions I received that day was take some Tylenol for the bleeding, for the cramping, and you can start your work tomorrow. No big deal. Got sent home with another bag of condoms, birth control pills to start the pill so it won't happen again, and to keep practicing safe sex. Well, they knew, they knew that it would start happening. It was going to happen again because there's no pill, there's no condom that prevents pregnancy or STDs. And they know this, it's a trap. That's why women have multiple abortions. 
So I thought that I left that day being the same girl I was before I was pregnant, focusing on my dreams, my success, my goals. I call my boyfriend up that night. I lie and tell him I had a miscarriage. And he started to cry over the phone for the loss, the miscarriage, when I know I had an abortion. Those guilty feelings started to come into my heart because there's a lot of guilt after abortion. It was nothing. It was just a sack of tissue. Don't cry. It wasn't the time. You know, maybe one day we'll get married and then, then we can start a family. And that's what I said. And my heart was stone. I couldn't even cry. After an abortion, a woman, something in a woman dies. Her heart dies. And her heart is numb. And that's exactly what happened to me. I soon started to feel symptoms of feeling very empty, very depressed, very sad. Um, I was very funny before. I was joyful. And I was just, everything would make me cry. Everything would make me mad. I was an emotional roller coaster. And I didn't understand what was going on. Post-abortion syndrome. Something they never tell you before you have an abortion or after. Something the media hides. They don't want you to know about this because if women knew about post-abortion syndrome, women probably wouldn't have an abortion. And men wouldn't take their women to have an abortion. They'd protect their woman. And I started to feel horrible, having nightmares. And my boyfriend started to feel sad. And my boyfriend started to feel empty. And he would tell me, I'm having nightmares. And I said, about what? He said, recurring nightmares. I see a little girl in a dream calling me daddy, daddy over and over. And he was suffering post-abortion syndrome because he had an abortion, but he didn't know about it. I hid that from him. I took that manhood, the fatherhood away from him without him knowing. Many women do this. And we continued having safe sex. But now I was being more responsible because I was using the birth control pill every day at the same time. Well, something went wrong. I took a second pregnancy test. And to my shock and surprise, it came out positive. And I thought, what's going on? How am I pregnant? I'm practicing safe sex, what they told me at school, what they told me at the clinic. What's going on? Okay, well, I'm only a month. It's literally a second tissue. I've done it once. I could do this again. This time it's easier. I already know what, what an abortion is. There's no need to tell my friends. There's no need to tell my boyfriend because this is very embarrassing. They're going to think that I didn't learn my lesson. And I just don't want my boyfriend to, you know, tell me that he wants to have a baby and blah, blah, blah. So I'll just go get an abortion and get it over with. But this is too shameful to go back to the same clinic. They're going to say, wait, you didn't learn your lesson. So I'll just go to a different clinic. This time I'll go to Planned Parenthood. They have a really good reputation. They went to my school when I was 12. They told me that they can, we could always go to their clinic. I know where they're at. And that's exactly what I did. I went to Planned Parenthood. And during my second abortion, did the same thing, blocked myself, closed my eyes, and just numb my heart. But then I heard the abortionist applauding. And when I opened my eyes, she said, you're completely amazing. You're not even moving. You're not crying. Most women who have abortions cry. They faint. You know, they, they're sweating. They're screaming. They're kicking. You're making my job so easy. You're not, you haven't even moved your legs. And I want to applaud you because you're a brave, courageous woman. You're probably the best patient I've ever had during an abortion. And since I was such a people pleaser and I loved when the world would applaud me, I went into the recovery room feeling like, a, like the best patient, proud of myself. And all the nurses came in, actually they're fake nurses and I'll let you guys know ahead why they're fake nurses. These fake nurses come in and they give me a robe and some slippers and some cookies and said, you did an amazing job. Good job. This was the best decision for your life. They never told me about post-abortion syndrome at Planned Parenthood. And I left that day with a bag of condoms and a bag of birth control pills to continue practicing safe sex. And I was a mess after the second abortion. I wasn't the same girl I was before the two pregnancies. I was pretty much suicidal, miserable. I'd look in the mirror. I used to like what I, what I would look at. And I would just see somebody that was very disgusting and distorted. Somebody that just didn't want to live anymore. 
somebody that had hell going up here and here. And there was just something really off and wrong. I was very, very thin at the time, but I didn't think I was. So I stopped eating and I had an eating disorder, more nightmares. And I would go to supermarkets or the mall and I'd see children and it would traumatize me. And I would tell my boyfriend I was very depressed and sad. And he would tell me that he was too, that there was something wrong with him. And we were both suffering terribly post-abortion syndrome, but he didn't know that he had two abortions because I never told him the truth. We continued having safe sex, but this time I was very miserable in this relationship. I didn't like him anymore. Um, when he'd come around, I'd want to throw up and vomit. And this is why many couples who have abortions, they just, there's a, a statistic, it's 90%, they don't last. Or married couples that have abortions, they end up in divorce if they don't heal. And I was just feeling different. And I just, I didn't like him very much anymore, but I felt so unlovable. I thought, you know, my family's a disaster. If I leave him, then who will love me? He loved me very much. And I would contemplate suicide all the time. And then again, for the third time, I started to feel sick. And that pregnancy test came out positive. And I was furious. I thought, wait, what's going on? If you actually Google the cheapest condoms, cheapest birth control, Planned Parenthood is on the top list because it's a trap. And I fell three times. And I was angry. I said, you know what? I'm not going to be the witch of the story. I don't want this burden on me. I'm just going to tell him that I'm going to go get an abortion. I call up my boyfriend. I tell him I'm pregnant. He's excited. I said, don't even get excited. I've already made an appointment to get an abortion. And I heard him say, but I don't want to have an abortion. I want to be a father. And the thing that people don't understand is when a woman is already pregnant, she already is a mother. And the man is already a father. But he said he wanted to have this baby. And I said, I don't care what you think. And when he said that he didn't want to have an abortion, that radical feminism came out in me. And I said, and who are you? Who are you? You have no, you have no control over my body. It is my body. It's my choice. You have no choice. So it doesn't matter what you think or what you say. I'm going to go to that appointment. If you want to come along, great. If you don't, I don't care. I don't care what you think. What I did for the third time was take his fatherhood away. I damaged his fatherhood. I took his masculinity away. I took his right and his voice away. There are many men that I've met that have told me, I tried to save the life of my baby. I stood in front of the clinic. I didn't want my girlfriend to go inside. And I had no voice and I had no rights. I was escorted by police. I was escorted by security. In many circumstances, the unborn have no voice. But if a woman wants to have an abortion and the man wants to save his baby, he doesn't have a voice either. He has no voice or no right. So when politicians, male politicians, are for women's rights, no, they're not. They're against women's rights. And they're also against men's rights. I go to the abortion clinic. I lay on that bed and my poor boyfriend was next to me. I think he was just scared that I'd leave him if he didn't go. I closed my eyes. I said, five minutes, third time. And when that vacuum sound was loud and my boyfriend heard it, I felt him squeeze my hand very, very tight. And I could tell he was very scared. And I opened my eyes and I see his eyes fill up with tears. And those five minutes were pretty long because the whole time I felt his tears bathe my face. He didn't want to have that abortion. And that's when I told myself inside my, inside my heart, what kind of a person am I? How did I get to have three abortions? How did I even get pregnant three times? Like I never thought that would happen to me. And most young kids think it will never happen to them. And most parents think that it will never happen to their kids. Oh yeah, it can happen to anybody. When kids 
don't know what true love is. Even adults don't even know what true love is. I mean, I have women and men that are married and they're, you know, they're not faithful to their spouse. I, I have people older than myself that have had abortions. It's when people don't know the virtue of chastity. That's the problem. The distorted sexuality in this culture. And after that abortion, I knew I would leave him. And I just wanted to run away far and start all over. And I left him and he was devastated. And I went and moved to Sacramento, California to start a new life, to forget about the three abortions, to forget about the ex-boyfriend and to start over. I looked for a job in the medical field and I saw in the newspaper that Planned Parenthood urgently needed a bilingual back office nurse, Spanish, English. Well, I was a receptionist, I was not a nurse. I could maybe offer my services in Spanish. They might need help translating. I'll just see what happens. Well, during my interview, they were so excited that I, I myself had had three abortions because this would help motivate women to come to their abortion appointments. And they were very excited that I was fluent in two languages. And they gave me the job, not as a medical receptionist, but as a back office nurse with a no credentials, never went to nursing school, never picked up an instrument, never assisted a surgery because an abortion is considered a surgery. Didn't know anything about being a nurse. And I started on a Monday morning at Planned Parenthood as an illegal nurse. And the people that were training me were also fake nurses. I get to Planned Parenthood that morning. I was put into my manager's office, the coldest, hearted woman I've ever met in my life. Patricia, we do 50 abortion appointments here per week. 25 on Wednesday, 25 on Friday. I'm talking about 1999. I mean, the numbers are higher than this. She said, you will counsel these women, mostly in Spanish, because 90% of the, the patients here speak Spanish. They don't speak any English here in California. Um, the Hispanics, are the, are the number one race and the Afro-American women are the number one race that abort because that's why abortion was created to target people like myself, minorities, to target the black community, to end our race. And that's why there were so many women that spoke Spanish, not English, and they needed somebody like myself. You will never use the word baby, mother, father, he or she. You will just refer it as an it, a sack of tissue. I don't care what you call it, it is an it. You can't even use the word fetus because that gives human dignity. Do you understand? I don't understand. Why am I changing my vocabulary? You know, I worked in the medical field. Um, why am I hiding stuff? During their ultrasound, they will never look at the screen. The screen always faces the abortionist. If the woman wants to look at the screen, she cannot. And I remember during my three appointments, they never let me look at the screen. Do you understand, Patricia? And I didn't understand. If these women don't make it to their abortion appointments, your job is on the line. And I didn't want my job to be on the line because they were actually paying me double the amount I was making back in my hometown because now I was a nurse. So that day I canceled I want to say women, because we always say abortion hurts women. Is a 13-year-old a woman? Is a 14-year-old a woman? I was mostly counseling little 13-year-olds. And I would say, wait, you're 13, you're a child, you're 13 years old. You're going to ruin your life. You're going to bring a child into this world to suffer. This is the best option. Look, I've had three abortions. I'm good. You're going to be okay. This is the best choice for you. I really thought I was doing an act of charity and helping these girls because they were only 13 years old. I thought I was doing something good. I thought I was defending women's rights and I thought I was helping the youth. Well, it was Wednesday morning where I saw the truth, the harsh truth of my reality and the reality of the abortion industry. I get to work that day my manager grabs me by the hand and puts me in her office and bluntly says, all right, there's an abortionist coming into the office today. You don't know who he is because women die 
during abortions. So a patient can die. So if her family tries to sue us, well, the abortionist is not from this office, so we don't just, we just have less issues. You will never tell a soul what you see behind these doors. Oh, and after each abortion, you will never tell the mothers. And she used the word mothers. Mother? So wait, that means that there's something in her womb that has dignity. Or you never tell the fathers that are in the waiting room. 14-year-old fathers, 15-year-old fathers. That after each abortion, we throw their babies away in the garbage. When she said those words, I felt like a spear just, just went, pierced my heart. And I felt fear, babies in the garbage. And I was too scared to ask any questions. And I just kind of rolled with the day. I ruined the first patient. And I just want to remind you, I'm already starting an abortion procedure, surgery, and I've never been trained. So I'm about to go into this procedure with an abortionist handling sharp instruments, not knowing what I was doing at all. This 15 year old goes into this room, into the procedure room and the abortionist comes in and he tells me in my ear, time is money. We have five minutes for each abortion. Time is money. We gotta get this done. So you'll be jumping behind me, five minutes in each, in each room. And something felt eerie, not right. I stood behind the abortionist and I saw a little table next to him with all these sharp objects. I mean, I'm talking about clamps, scissors, blades. And uh, he takes out the injection, the anesthesia, big needle. It needs to be long so it can go inside the cervix and numb up the womb. But this injection is only for the woman, the young girl or the teen. It's not for the sack of tissue that's inside. He said, we're gonna start the procedure. He turns on the vacuum machine, the suction machine. He takes out the tip and on the tip of the tip, there's like literally a blade. I kind of want to pause here because I know that abortion is very hard uh, to listen. It's very hard to listen about abortion. I just want to say something special about the unborn. These are the saints of our times. These are the martyrs of the martyrs. Because not only are they martyred every single day, but they're martyred by their own parents, their own mothers, their own fathers. And I've had many people walk out on my story right at this point. But if we have the courage to hear the stories of the saints that were martyred and tortured, and we admire them, and we even share those stories, I ask that you please have the heart to hear the story of the martyrs of our times because they deserve that dignity. They are the bloodshed that is sustaining us today. And he starts the abortion on this young 15 year old girl. And it was the most violent thing I've ever seen in my life. She starts kicking, she starts screaming. And once the abortionist is in with the sharp object, he can't stop. He has to make sure that everything is out because if any little piece is left in, she could die. She can hemorrhage. She can have an infection afterwards and die like many women have. So he's in this, doing this procedure and he's dodging her legs and she's kicking. And I'm like, this is just violence. And that's why you can never accept abortion in any case. We cannot say that we're pro-life, but in cases of rape or in cases if the mom is sick or if the case of the baby, we cannot say that we're for abortion. That contradicts pro-life. Abortion never cures rape because it's just violence on top of violence. The woman's actually worse. And this is very violent. And he looks at his watch and he says, I think I'm done. And that's when it dawns on me. What do you mean you think? When does a doctor do a surgery and, and say to his staff, I think I'm done, not sure. 
I think we can, we can stop this heart operation or we can just stop. It's a blind man's surgery. The doctor cannot see what he is doing inside the womb with the sharp object. That's why many women can't have children after. That's why many wombs are perforated. That's why many organs are perforated because he cannot see. This is completely dangerous. So the whole concept of safe abortion does not exist. And they use this to legalize abortion in many countries, safe abortion, legalize it, it'll be safe. It is never safe, even if it's legal. And I turn the machine off and I see the amount of blood in a cylinder and that cylinder is opened and it's all the contents is poured into this little bag. And I grab this bag and I was escorted to this little room that was hidden behind Planned Parenthood. And my coworker, fake nurse, says, shut the door. Because if anybody, that patient sees what we're about to see right now, then we can get sued and we can be, getting, we can be in big trouble. There's a big dish in front of me, a Petri dish. And I poured out these contents into the Petri dish thinking I'm gonna look for a sack of tissue because that's what I told this girl two days before her, her abortion appointment. The smell of death was so strong. Abortion has a smell. I've smelt it. And she takes out these tweezers, this instrument called forceps, and she starts to dig. And to my surprise, she holds up to the light, a little arm with a hand extended like this. And she said, this is part number one. We need five parts of the baby to confirm that the abortion was successful. And it was as if time had stopped. And the first thing I noticed on those little fingertips were the fingerprints. And I thought to myself, fingerprints identify us as authentic, irrepeatable human beings. There's nobody in the world that has my fingerprint. There's nobody in the world that is like me. That makes me authentic human. And she finds the second part, the second arm. She finds the third, which is a little leg. And I could see the footprints. I could see the toenails. I can't even see hair on the baby's skin that was growing. She finds the fourth part. But the part that really broke my heart was the fifth. It was the head. The anesthesia was for the mom. It was not for the baby. The baby felt every second of that abortion. That baby's mouth was open because he was screaming for his life. He was fighting. He was trying to live. But unfortunately, there was nobody there to defend him. There was nobody there that could hear him. And he lost the battle. And when she puzzled this body back together, it hurt so much to know that I was lied to, that I was deceived, that this baby was three months and I aborted at four. And that's where I saw my harsh and cruel reality, that I did not abort three seconds of tissues. I aborted three of my own children, that these were human beings. I was so terrified by this, but I kept it inside. I just kept going and all day and this Holocaust, it was just like this factory of killing babies. And back then insurance didn't cover abortions. Now insurance covers it. These kids were paying cash and it was a money making day. And it was just looking for body parts, seeing women cry, scream, women would faint. They were dragged down the halls, blood everywhere. It, it's ghoulish. I think an abortion clinic is probably the most horrifying thing we could ever see on this planet. There's nothing more evil and horrifying than, than seeing what I saw. At the end of the day, there's 25 babies in pieces in a trash can. Why? Why? Because there's distorted concept of love in the world because these kids don't know what true love is. They don't know that there's something special when they wait and that sexuality is sacred. 
These babies are paying the price of their life because of our sin, because of our sexual distortion. And it's not fair. I tied the bag up, put the date on it, and I put them inside this big freezer. And they, they freeze like blocks of ice. And I remember seeing this image of just blocks of ice of all the aborted babies that month at Planned Parenthood. And back then, they got thrown in a dumpster every month. Recently, people, you know, abortionists were selling their organs. They were, the, the money making didn't end after the abortion. It kept going. I would cry every day in my car, in my vehicle. I just, I was scared to leave that job because I was on my own for the first time, you know, and how was I going to pay my school? But I just couldn't take it anymore. I was there for about a little bit less than a month. And I was supposed to assist a young girl that was six months pregnant with twins. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't see two siblings in a trash can. And I ran out of there terrified. I mean, my heart was beating so fast. I didn't want to see twins. And I cried and I, I didn't know God. I didn't, I forgot about him. So I started to seek refuge in drugs. Never thought I'd do drugs. I was pretty much a prep in school. I remember in the 12th, um, you know, when I was in, in high school, I won an award, the D.A.R.E. program, why I would never do drugs. But this is one of the symptoms of post-abortion symptom. I mean, I was suffering post-abortion symptom after my three abortions. Well, this trauma is far beyond working. I mean, far beyond trauma, working in an abortion clinic, feeling like a true murderer. I was a part of these abortions, of these people killing their own children. Started doing cocaine, um, got very addicted. Cocaine didn't do anything anymore. Um, you know, when the effect would wear off, the numbness would go away in my heart and I'd suffer even more. So I tried methamphetamine and I was dating somebody that was completely addicted to drugs and selling drugs. And what started to happen was I, I was dysfunctional. I couldn't go to work. I couldn't go to school. I wasn't me anymore. I was lost, a drug addict. I couldn't pay my school. I couldn't pay my apartment. I couldn't pay my car payment. And I, I lost everything. And I ended up living on the streets for three years at the, as a methamphetamine addict. I could never ask my dad for help because I was a complete failure. I was trash. I was nobody. I was supposed to be somebody. I was supposed to be successful. I was supposed to travel the world. I was supposed to be admired by the world. And now everybody knows that I was just this bum that was addicted to drugs, that was just trash. I was a nobody. And I remember looking in the mirror one day. I weighed about, I don't know, 30 kilos. I was just bones. I had no hair. I had ripped all my hair out. I was completely bald. But I remember looking in the mirror and looking at my eyes. Who are you? What happened to you? What happened to that young little princess that was popular in school that had straight A's, that had a family and that, that was loved? And I could only see a person that was dead. I just saw a woman that was dead walking and roaming the earth and there was no hope in my eyes anymore. I was lost. And I remember one day uh, it's, 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 it was the day I hit rock bottom. I had nothing to eat for four days. I hadn't slept in four days. I was so thirsty. And my boyfriend had left me on a sidewalk curb after being and following him around for three years. And I started to weep because I thought I would die on the street. And I asked myself, what will become of my life? What will happen to me? Will I even survive? And as I started to weep, this overwhelming feeling of peace came into my heart that I've never felt. And I felt a presence up in the sky, like a strong presence looking down at me with so much love. And that's when I remembered that when I was a child, I would write love notes to God and I would fold them up in a little piece of paper and I would tie them on a ribbon that was connected to the balloon and I would look up at heaven and I felt loved by God. I started to remember that. I forgot about him. 
that I hadn't looked up in so many years. And at that moment, I realized that that was all that I had. And I looked up at the sky after so many years and I said, I remember you. I know that you exist. I don't have anything right now. You're the only thing I have. I don't have drugs. I don't have my boyfriend. I don't have my family. I'm lost. I know that you gave me a beautiful family. I know that you gave me so many beautiful opportunities and I've destroyed my life because of all the choices that I've made. And I want to ask for your forgiveness. There was something in my heart that it's inspired me to repent. And this great peace just kept overfilling me. And I knew that everything was going to be okay. And one minute after that prayer, this young girl, exactly my age, ran out of a restaurant that was at the corner of the street. And she ran and she looked at me with the most merciful, loving eyes. And she held me. Then she backed away, looked at me with so much conviction and said, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. I'm a waitress at the restaurant on the corner. And I saw you crying on the street and I started to pray for you. And God told me to tell you that even if your mother or father shall forsake you, that he will never forsake you, that he will be with you until the end of time and everything you've done in your life, he forgives you. Well, my friends, that was the second encounter that I had with Jesus. The first one was when I was a child when I saw the sacred heart. But this second one was the king of mercy. And I know that through Bonnie, I know that through her eyes, he was using her to transmit his forgiveness and his mercy. I knew that it wasn't her that lifted me off the street and held me. I knew it was Jesus that went into her heart. It was Jesus that used her legs to walk out of that restaurant and have courage. I know it was Jesus that used her arms to hold me and embrace me. And I know it was Jesus that was through her eyes that gave me love and compassion. That is the encounter with the most holy and merciful face of Jesus. And that young girl took me home to my father's house after three years. And thank God that when I knocked on my father's door, I thought, oh my God, he's going to yell at me. I am trash. And he opened that door. And I I threw myself to his feet. I asked for his forgiveness because the youth forget that we also make our parents suffer. You know, we think that our parents nag, but we also hurt our parents by our actions. And I hurt my father. My father was so loving. And he said, it's okay. You are home. Welcome back. Just like the prodigal son. My mom had heard about me missing. She heard about my drug addiction. She moved back to California. She bought a home and she came back to the Catholic faith. She was in such agony because of the choices that I made. A friend told her that new age was not the way and guided her back home. So when my mom found out I was back home, she picked me up and she said, I don't believe in this new age and this witchcraft I'm home. I'm back home to the Catholic faith. And what happened, Patricia, is that I never told you who you really were. You don't know who who you are. You You don't know your identity. That's why so many youth are lost. That's why so many youth are involved in drugs, alcoholism, pornography, because nobody's told them who they are. You are a child of God. That is your identity. You are the princess of the king of kings. You're not worthy because you were popular, because you were a straight A student, because you were successful. The only reason you're worthy is because Jesus shed the last drop of blood for you on the cross. Your identity is the blood of Christ, period. And it was my mom and her prayers and God's mercy that brought me back to my father's house. I believe it was my mom's prayers that brought Bonnie out of that restaurant. 
And I was believed it was my mom's prayers that, that just, you know, inspired me to repent. My mom prayed on her knees for three years in front of the blessed sacrament. My mom offered every daily mass, every rosary, everything, fasting, praying for God to give her this miracle. And God hears the prayers of a mother. So if you are a mother and you are listening to me right now, do not give up. God exalts mothers. That's why he exalted his own mother and made her mother of creation, mother of God, mother of the church. She, he made her our grand in, intercession. He hears your prayers. He is faithful. Don't give up. And my mom took me to confession. My mom took me to daily mass. My mom showed me the word of God. And she said, do you see this Bible, Patricia? Do you see this? You would write love notes to God. But these are love notes that God now has for you. And my mom just helped me get through the, those years in the walk and heal so many things that were wrong with me. I never went to rehab. It was confession in the Eucharist. That set me free from so many things. But the one thing that was very difficult for me to forgive was the abortions. Because not only did I have them, I saw with my own eyes where my children ended up in a dumpster, in a trash can. I saw it. I smelled abortion. I touched abortion. I felt it. I lived it. Not only having them, but being in that, in that clinic. I needed healing from abortion. I couldn't forgive myself. So I went to a Rachel's Vineyard retreat. Now, I just want to say that it's important that women have some type of post-abortion healing. Confession, it's amazing, but it, the trauma is so great mentally and emotionally, there needs to be therapy. So I went to a Rachel's Vineyard retreat, rachelsvineyard.org. It's all over the world. I went in Friday as a murderer. I killed. I helped kill. The shame was so great. But Saturday evening during prayer, I closed my eyes and prayed. And I saw my three children, a little girl, a little boy, and a little girl. Mariana, Emmanuel, Rosario. And I was walking towards them. And they started to scream a word that I never thought I would hear. Mother! Mother! Mother? Never thought of myself as a mother. We love you. We're in heaven praying for you. And we're waiting for you. Then I heard Jesus' voice in my heart say, my daughter, I conquered death on the cross. I'm victorious over death. Your children are alive in heaven. They're under Mary's mantle. Do you see the dresses your daughters are wearing? The Virgin Mary put those dresses on your daughters so you see how beautiful they are. Do you see the bows in your daughter's hair? The Virgin Mary comb their hair and put those little bows so you see how pretty your daughters are. Do you see how your son is dressed to your liking? Well, the Blessed Virgin did this because she knows your liking. Know this, daughter, that when you get to heaven, Our Lady will hand them over to you. And when I open my eyes to see the mercy of my children, is what I needed to forgive myself. I knew God forgave me. But when I saw their mercy, I was able to forgive myself. And that was the weekend that I decided to defend life. No matter if I would have bricks and stones thrown at me, no matter if I'd lose family member, friends, no matter how heavy the cross would be, because it's far harder to tell an abortion story in Latin America. We're a little bit more <laughs> judgmental than here in the States. And it was very difficult. I had much persecution from Planned Parenthood. I lost family members. I lost friends. Um, I was criticized. But I kept my promise to God. Because if one life can be saved through this story, then it was all worth it to repair the damage that I've done. But now I know that the pro-life movement is great. Because not only is one life saved through a baby, but a whole generation is saved. So when we help save those babies, when we pray for them, God will show us in heaven the prayers that we did, the rosaries we did for them, the times we stood out of those abortion clinics, 
the things that we can't see, he's going to show us all those babies that were saved through our sacrifice, through our love and the pro-life movement. Not only the babies that were saved, but the generations that were saved. So my friends, I just want to say this, ending this story. When I tell my story, I relive those images. I remember the faces of those babies in agony, screaming with their mouth open to live. That is the same holy phase of our Lord Jesus Christ when he was suffering his ag agony. It dawned on me a couple months ago that the unborn are probably the creatures that look like Jesus the most. Jesus was crucified. His martyrdom, his martyrdom was so pure because he was sinless, faultless. There was no condemnation in him. Well, these children have never been born into sin. These children are martyred before they were born. So they are sinless. They have no condemnation. They have no guilt. They're the purest form of martyrdom, just like Jesus. So when you see those images of aborted babies and you kind of want to get grossed out and, gro <laughs> and feel like, ugh, it's too much, it's gruesome. It's a holy image because it reflects the holy face and martyrdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to end on a happy note, I am married with the very holy Saint Joseph and God gave me the grace to have a little baby. And I named her after Our Lady of Victories, Maria Victoria, because my daughter's birth is a miracle. And I want to thank Our Lady because I know she's taking care of all those little children in heaven. And I want to thank her for everything that she's done for us and for our salvation. Because if it wasn't for her pro-life, yes, we would have no salvation. Thank you very much. And please count on my prayers for you and all your family. But I ask that you also pray for me and mine. And all the glory for today and this talk is for the glory of God. Amen. Amen.